are recording, so but we're not showing you again. Hey, Paul, could you try to look at the AV paper, please? Good afternoon. I am Robin Axel Adams, the manager of the Fairbank Center for Medical Ethics. We will be working on getting our AV working here in just a second. So I'm going to introduce Jane while um, while that's uh, that's being worked on. Welcome to our uh, annual um, Dr. Meg Gaffney lecture on humanism and medicine. This lecture is being recorded and broadcast today um, all over Indiana. So we welcome you who are on broadcast with us. Just as a reminder to please silence your electronic devices, and if you do need to take a call to, to please leave the auditorium to be able to do that. And then finally, just as a reminder that Jane has no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose. So it's my pleasure to introduce today uh, Jane Hartsock, who is not a stranger to us, certainly here at the lecture series or within um, FCME and clinical ethics. She is the brand new director of clinical ethics for the Academic Health Center at IU Health. And she is faculty with both the IU School of Medicine for Bioethics and the IU School of Liberal Arts uh, Medical Humanities and Health Studies program. Jane completed, completed a BA in English with a concentration in writing from Butler University in 1999. And then she obtained her JD from Indiana University's uh, Robert H. McKinney School of Law in 2002, where she focused her coursework on medical legal issues. And after completion of her law degree and admission to the Illinois State Bar, Jane spent 10 years in healthcare litigation, primarily defending hospitals, clinicians, and long-term care facilities in Chicago, Illinois. Upon returning to Indianapolis in 2013, Jane completed a Master's of Philosophy with a concentration in bioethics and did her fellowship in clinical medical ethics at IU Health uh, Fairbank Center for Medical Ethics with us. Jane has published in the area of transplant ethics, narrative ethics, and the ethics of biobanking and big data. She's also assist assisted clinicians at Indiana University in drafting theoretically informed testing information sheets, letters of communicating complex test results, and consent forms. And so it is my great pleasure to welcome Jane up here to share with us. Thank you, Jane. Hello, everybody. Um, it's very nice to be here. I see some of my students here, which is always really fun for me. Um, OK. Uh, how do I forward, actually? The... OK. So we're going to have kind of a, a, a little bit of a micro talk today. We're going to break off a piece of clinical practice that we don't usually give much thought to, um, or maybe, maybe not enough thought. Um, and we're going to talk about um, this uh, in, in quite a bit of depth. So um, we're going to begin by identifying the obstacles to effective asyn asynchronous patient communication. I'm going to define these terms very shortly. Um, we're going to discuss the um, components of self-determination theory as an effective and ethically compatible model for crafting correspondence to patients. So this is our sort of micro discussion, this, this communication, this written communication that goes between, um, goes from the clinician to the patient. Uh, and then we will apply self-determination theory to a specific clinical context. I have a little case study that we can discuss to demonstrate the applied use of that theory. Um, but before we get started, I have to acknowledge my um, dear friend and colleague that I've been doing this work with. Um, this is Dr. Catherine Head, who is an assistant professor of communication studies at the IU School of Liberal Arts. And she and I have um, been doing this work absolutely collaboratively and originally planned to give this lecture together. So I was going to provide the sort of ethics um, picture, and she, as a communication scholar, was going to provide the communication theory component. But she is presently putting together her dossier for tenure and felt like if she had to put together one more thing, she was going to lose her mind. Um, so, uh, so she asked if I could uh, do this lecture on behalf of both of us today. Um, but I absolutely want to acknowledge her hard work um, and expertise in this area um, and thank her for her partnership um, uh, in our work with some of the clinics here on campus. So uh, to begin with some definitions. I titled my lecture, as you notice, Into the Void, which was, I think, a little bit as a result of um, spending too much time on Netflix, because I think that's a movie. Um, and it was just like, OK, we'll go with that. But, um, but what I'm really getting at here with that, uh, 
with that title is, is this idea of the asynchronous communication that happens between clinicians and patients. So asynchronous communication is communication where only one side is communicating, only one side is doing the talking, or in this case, the writing, and one side is entirely passive, receiving the information. Um, rather than those uh, sort of in-clinic encounters where one person would be talking and another person would be talking um, and you would have questions and answers and, and a sort of collaborative conversation. Um, so uh, asynchronous communication presents, as we can probably guess, some real obstacles and barriers to effectively communicating, uh, getting adequate understanding from patients um, through writing. and. Um, Part of that, you know, I think we sense as clinicians in, in sort of as reference to the title, this idea of sending something out, whether it's a voicemail, a letter, you know, whatever it is, and where does it go and who gets it and how do they receive it and what do they do with it and does it actually sort of connect um, uh, with anybody. So there are a number of examples of asynchronous communication in the healthcare context and those include, as I said, voicemails, um, postcards, um, the portal test results uh, that patients can access, decision aids, um, so the videos and pamphlets that we give patients um, to help them make decisions about, for example, whether they want to get a mammogram or you know something like that. Uh, and then what we're going to talk about today is actually the letter writing. So these letters that we write to patients in a lot of different contexts. Um, and so, um, we write these letters as part of our clinical practice, and they are out of clinic asynchronous communications. So they are received by a patient usually when they're sitting at home, um, when they have really no opportunity then to respond to the letter, to ask um, questions. And some settings in clinical practice rely more heavily on this form of communication than other settings. So we see these, um, these, this emphasis on, on letter writing to patients uh, oftentimes in the neuropsych uh, arena, uh, certainly with genetic testing, um, in precision medicine, in the uh, cancer context, uh, and then letters following screening. So a patient comes in and they, they do a screening um, for um, signs of memory loss or dementia, and, um, and they receive a letter indicating that their screening, for example, suggests they should follow up with additional testing or, or something along those lines. So these letters um, oftentimes aren't given much thought, but they're incredibly complex, as many of you know who, who draft them. Um, they're intended oftentimes to serve multiple purposes, and this is part of the reason why the letters themselves can be so difficult to draft, and as we'll talk about, so difficult for patients to understand. Um, so these letters oftentimes are merely a record of the visit. They're actually not, although addressed to a patient, they're actually written for the physician, him or herself, so that they can go back into the chart and remember what happened. Um, they may be written uh, really for purposes of communicating with other clinicians, so the letter is addressed to the patient with a CC to their referring physician or a, a consultant that they need to see next, and the letter is written really for the benefit of that CC. Um, they can be for purposes of communicating with schools in developing an IEP, even though they're addressed to um, the patient or the parent of the patient. Um, but they're oftentimes not really written with the patient in mind. So what I would like to do today is suggest that this letter writing is actually one of our most valuable resources in terms of effectively communicating with patients. So getting them to understand what happened at their clinic visit and motivating them to take whatever the next step is that we or, or you as clinicians would want them to take. Um, so it can provide them with comfort and empathy and um, importantly to our clinicians, motivate them to take um, steps such as additional testing, adherence to a treatment plan, or um, communicating with teachers or referring clinicians or family members um, about um, their appointment. So this matters to me as an ethicist. Um, as, as Katie and I were talking about this project, you know, she has no ethics background and I have no communication background. Um, and so trying to collaborate with each other and talk about, you know, how does, how does this get at sort of both of these things? How do we do both of these things with our letter writing? This matters to me as an ethicist because these letters can operate to promote autonomy 
Um, and then they also can operate to promote adherence to particular follow-up um, plans of care, and that can improve wellness. Um, and I'm really only referring to, as we go through this um, talk today, I'm really only referring to the letters that are written anyway. So I'm not suggesting that those of you who are not, who don't do this as part of your regular practice should suddenly start adopting a, you know, a widespread letter writing campaign for your patients that might not be feasible or part of the culture of your practice or really necessary. Um, but for those of you for whom it is, I would like to suggest maybe a, a slightly different approach to it. Um, so when I was thinking about um, this, this talk and how to articulate what the sort of core problem is here, um, and really what the problem is that letter writing can specifically address, I was reminded of the nature of this particular lecture, um, the Meg Gaffney Lecture on Humanism in Medicine. And so we're predominantly clinicians uh, in the room, and I want to take you into the perspective of our patients as they receive um, oftentimes traumatic, difficult to receive news. Um, and so to do that, I'm going to read for you um, a bit of a short story uh, by Lori Moore called um, People Like That Are the Only People Here, Canonical Babbling in Pedonk. And I have timed this, so I, it will be okay. I won't read to you all afternoon. I think it'll take about eight minutes. So we'll see. Um, Let's see now, says the surgeon in one of his examining rooms. He has stepped in, then stepped out, then come back in again. He has crisp, frowning features, sharp bones, and a tennis in Bermuda tan. He crosses his blue cottoned legs. He is wearing clogs. The mother knows her own face is a big, white dumpling of worry. She is still wearing her long, dark parka, holding the baby who has pulled the hood up over her head because he always thinks it's funny to do that. Though on certain windy mornings, she would like to think that she could look vaguely romantic like this, like some French lieutenant's woman of the prairie. In all of her saner moments, she knows she doesn't, ever. She knows she looks ridiculous, like one of those animals made out of twisted party balloons. She lowers the hood and slips one arm out of the sleeve. The baby wants to get up and play with the light switch. He fidgets, fusses, and points. He's big on lights these days, explains the mother. That's okay, says the surgeon, nodding towards the light switch. Let him play with it. The mother goes and stands by it, and the baby begins turning the lights off and on, off and on. What we have here is a Wilms tumor, says the surgeon, suddenly plunging into darkness. He says tumor as if it were the most normal thing in the world. Wilms, repeats the mother. The room is quickly on fire again with light, then wiped dark again. Among the three of them here, there is a long silence, as if it were suddenly the middle of the night. Is that apostrophe S or S apostrophe, the mother says finally. She is a writer and a teacher. Spelling can be important, perhaps even at times like this, though she has never before been at a time like this. So there are barbarisms she could easily commit and not know. The lights come on. The world is doused and exposed. S apostrophe, says the surgeon, I think. The lights go back out, but the surgeon continues speaking in the dark. A malignant tumor on the left kidney. Wait a minute. Hold on here. The baby is only a baby, fed on organic applesauce and soy milk, a little prince, and he was standing so close to her during the ultrasound. How could he have this terrible thing? It must have been her kidney a 50s kidney, a DDT kidney. The mother clears her throat. Is it possible it was my kidney on the scan? I mean, I've never heard of a baby with a tumor, and frankly, I was standing very close. She would make the blood hers, the tumor hers. It would, it would all be some treacherous, farcical mistake. No, that's not possible, says the surgeon. The light goes back on. We will start with a radical nephrectomy, says the surgeon, instantly thrown into darkness again. His voice comes from nowhere and everywhere all at once. And then we'll begin with chemotherapy after that. These tumors usually respond well to chemo. I've never heard of a baby having chemo, the mother says. Baby and chemo, she thinks. They should never even appear in the same sentence together, let alone the same life. In her other life, her life before this day, she had been a believer in alternative medicine. Chemotherapy? Unthinkable. Now, suddenly, 
Alternative medicine seems the wacko maiden aunt to the nice big daddy of conventional treatment. How quickly the old girl faints and gives way, leaving one just standing there. Chemo? Of course chemo. Why, by all means, chemo. Absolutely chemo. The baby flicks the switch back on and the walls reappear. Big wedges of light checkered with small framed watercolors of the local lake. The mother has begun to cry. All of life has led her here to this moment. After this, there is no more life. There is something else, something stumbling and unlivable, something mechanical, something for robots, but not life. Life has been taken and broken quickly like a stick. The room goes dark again so that the mother can cry more freely. How can a baby's body be stolen so fast? How much can one heaven sent and unsuspecting child endure? Why has he not been spared this inconceivable fate? She had on three occasions used formula bottles as flower vases. She twice let the baby's ears get fudgy with wax. A few afternoons last month at snack time, she had placed a bowl of Cheerios on the floor for him to eat just like a dog. She let him play with the dust buster. Just once before, she, before he was born, she said, healthy, ha, I just want a kid to be rich. A joke for God's sake. After he was born, she announced that her life had become a daily sequence of mind-wrecking chores, the same ones over and over again, like a novel by Mrs. Camus. Another joke. These jokes will kill you. She had told too often and with too much enjoyment the story of how the baby had said hi to his high chair, waved at the lake waves, shouted, goody, 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 in what seemed to be a Russian accent, pointed at his eyes and said ice. And all that nonsensical baby talk, wasn't it a stitch? Canonical babbling, the language experts call it. He recounted whole stories in it, totally made up. She could tell. He embroidered, he fished, he exaggerated. What a card. To friends, she spoke of his eating habits. Carrots, yes, tuna, no. She mentioned too much his side-splitting giggle. Did she have to be so boring? Did she have no consideration for others, for the intellectual demands and courtesies of human society? Would she not even attempt to be more interesting? It was a crime against the human mind not even to try. Now her baby, for all these reasons, lack of motherly gratitude, motherly judgment, motherly proportion, will be taken away. The room is fluorescently ablaze again. The mother digs around in her parka pocket and comes up with a Kleenex. It is old and thin, like a mashed flower saved from a dance. She dabs it at her eyes and nose. The baby won't suffer as much as you, says the surgeon, and who can contradict? Not the baby, who in his Slavic Betty Boop voice can only say, mama, dada, cheese, ice, bye-bye, outside, boogie-boogie, goody-goody, Eddie-Eddie, and car. Who is Eddie? They have no idea. So the story is called Canonical Babbling. Um, in Pedonk, and there's an irony in the title, um, inherent in the title, um, that canonical babbling is the language, the pre-language of children. But in this setting, upon re receiving the bad news of her child, the mother is re reduced to canonical babbling, to that sort of pre-language state. Nothing makes sense. There's no coherence here. Um, and there's a play on it as well, to the extent that the information she receives from the clinician from the surgeon might as well be canonical babbling for as much as it will be, be understandable um, in that context. And so this is where our patients are sitting when they receive some of this news about their children, about their spouses, about themselves, um, and uh, the, the inability to make sense in those moments. So here are, here's some of the information um, that may be uh, important to us as we consider our, our communication with patients as we give them sometimes very traumatic news. So by some estimates, 40 to 80 percent of medical information provided by healthcare practitioners in face-to-face -face interactions is forgotten immediately. The more medical information that patients are provided, the greater proportion they forget. So we can't fix this by just telling them more. They'll actually forget a greater percentage of it. Um, distress exacerbates this phenomenon. So we see that in, our, in the excerpt from this short story. As you listen to the sort of internal 
monologue of the mother, you hear no information going in from the clinician who presumably is talking to her through this time. 12% um, of Americans, only 12% of Americans have proficient health literacy. So proficient health literacy is generally defined as some ability to manipulate sort of numeric um, probabilities in medicine, so the ability to weigh risks and benefits. Um, I won't tell you the complete ending of this story, but it does end with the, with somewhat with the mother deciding to elect, uh, enroll in a clinical trial. Um, and it's presented by the author as if that's a happy ending. But those of us in medicine may know that somebody who appreciates the nature of clinical trials would not necessarily consider that a happy ending. It's an uncertain ending at best. Nearly half of the general population reads below a ninth grade reading level. And there are other stat statistics here that, that may be important as well. I mean, a third of the US population cannot read instructions on a prescription label consistently and understand what time or how to space the medications. So on top of all of this, so the distress that patients experience that creates a sort of block to really any kind of effective communication, um, and the, the sort of average um, health literacy of our patients, the information that we're communicating to patients in the 21st century has become increasingly complex. So we might think of letters in the past going to patients communicating a positive negative, right? Your tests came back and they indicated, yes, you have, no, you don't, you know, those kinds of things. Um, like I think of the, the um, pap smear test being the sort of um, perfect example of that. The postcard comes, you were normal, you weren't. Um, and interestingly enough, some of Dr. Head's research in that indicates that patients don't even understand the meaning of those postcards. Um, so, um, but these things have become much more complex. Sometimes we're only advising patients of a risk rather than an actual disease. So you're at an increased risk of having a disease and patients having the ability to, again, weigh what that means in terms of making decisions. Um, sometimes a negative is bad news. So where you might think the, you know, you came up negative four, blah, 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 um, would be good news in the context particularly of precision medicine and cancer um, uh, treatment. That negative result oftentimes means there are no further treatment options or no alternative treatment options for a patient. And so that's bad news. And so these can be confusing um, for patients as they, um, try to, to navigate what they should do next. Sometimes, to, to even layer on the complexity, we're not even necessarily concerned with the risk to the patient themselves. We're trying to advise them of a risk to somebody other than themselves, usually a child or a family member. And so then they have to make decisions about how to communicate this increasingly complex information. So in the middle of that, we ask for decisions. Right. So, uh, and the movement away from paternalistic medicine requires that patients be active participants in their treatment plans. So they're asked to make decisions. So here's the upshot. Out of clinic communication has to convey dense, difficult to understand information in a way that an average patient can understand while also motivating that patient to engage in some desired behavior such as returning to a referring physician or urging a family member to undergo genetic testing, for example. So this is a monumental task for a letter going to a patient um, in contemporary medicine. Here's the good news. Receiving a written summary of a visit does improve retention and recall. So patients, research um, by Brown indicates that patients who are given written materials remembered twice as much information from the appointment as those who did not receive um, written materials. Receiving a letter after an appointment does increase patients' knowledge of their own condition. 92% of patients in a recent study indicated that a, receiving a letter helped them better understand their genetic information and I would just suggest that genetic information might be sort of the um, most complex thing we would ask our patients to understand, um, maybe. 50% uh, of patients found that a letter helped them better understand their child's condition. 
And I see this as being particularly important because maybe I'm, I'm biased as a mom, but I think receiving bad news about your own child would be perhaps the most traumatic news that you could get, providing the most distress and the most sort of barrier to understanding. So this data is all before we get to the project of making our letters theoretically informed. These are just letters that um, clinicians have created in their practice um, in order to increase, really increase competence, right? You increase your ability to understand. They're not really focused on any other aspect of, of the clinical encounter or the physician-patient relationship, um, and they're not theoretically informed. Um, so this is good, we start here. Um, but what this also indicates is that these letters are enormously important to our patients. Um, and the importance of the, this form of communication is often not reflected in the amount of time or thought that are put into these letters. So in fact, even though they're addressed to the patients, they're often not written for the patients. Just as an aside, just thinking about the way we approach you know, who letters are written for and um, who our communication is designed to address, I ran the IU Health um, general consent form through the Fleshman Kincaid reading scale and it pops out at a graduate level reading. So like, who's that written for? <laughs> Lawyers. Um, I can say that because I am one. Um, so, so there's a way to make these, these letters more thoughtful. And I, you know, I think also we have to begin with the question of you know, being a little bit more honest in what we're using them for. So if the purpose of this letter really is to communicate with your colleague who referred the patient, address the letter to the colleague and move on. Um, but if what we're really trying to do is satisfy these sorts of um, objectives, increase understanding from the patient, help them retain information that happened during the appointment, we're gonna have to use a, a theoretically informed approach to that. We're gonna have to change the way we do it a little bit. Um, and so I'd like to suggest that there exists a good model for doing this. So uh, self-determination theory is an existing theory um, by Ryan and uh, De De Desi, I, am, I always pronounce that wrong. It's a general theory of motivation. So let me unpack that a little bit. Um, motivation, making somebody do something, is very, very tricky. Um, and as a student told me actually last night in class, um, making people feel something is easy making people do something with that feeling is hard. I see my students smiling. Yeah. So, um, so what we want to do oftentimes with these letters is make somebody do something, right? You want them to follow up with a clinician. You want them to get more testing. You want them to talk to a family member. You want them to re go back to whoever they you know, were sent there by. Um, and so th this theory is a theory that has been empirically proven to improve motivation. So let me say just a little bit about, a little bit more about motivation. So most of our clinical practice is premised on what we might think of as sort of external um, factors. We, we want to sort of um, convince somebody to do something. Oftentimes we use just a little bit of fear um, to get them to do that. Um, if you don't do this, sort of this will happen. But what we found, um, what, what researchers have found, is that the best motivation to get somebody to do something is to increase their intrinsic, um, appeal to their intrinsic self, the things that sort of self-motivate. And um, I use the sort of good coach, bad coach analogy here, because I was an athlete, and so I've had good coaches and bad, bad coaches. And so a bad coach makes you come to practice and work hard because you're afraid of him or her, right? Like you don't want to get yelled at, you don't want to have kickboards thrown at you. Um, and so you, you come to practice because you're afraid of, you know, sprint work, um, punishment. A good coach, right, gets you to come to practice by helping you set goals that you can achieve and then helping you create a plan to achieve them, which is rewarding, right? You, you want to, you want to um, get better at whatever it is that you're doing, and so you, you, know, you kind of are intrinsically motivated towards coming to practice because it's the only way for you to get the things that you want, the faster time, the better dunk, whatever it is. So these three components um, of self-determination self -determina de theory 
um, center around um, a, a, an Aristotelian model of flourishing, human flourishing, which of course appeals to me as an ethicist, right? So, um, so the idea here is that humans are innately active, curious, playful, inclined towards learning, um, that they prefer choice over forced compliance, that they enjoy psychological growth, um, and that they demand a coherent sense of self. And we can debate whether or not that's true. Um, I'm sure there, you know, there are people in the room who may feel like, I don't know if I'm gonna take that as a given. But um, I'll just say that the, there are some pretty strong arguments for it based on research um, done by these individuals that if you can, that if we premise our belief on the, the human need to flourish and address that, um, you know, we can get somewhere. So, uh, so Ryan and DC have broken down those three human basic needs um, uh, into these components. A need, competence, a need to be effective in dealing with the environment. So we might think of this as a need for knowledge, a need to understand, a need to know what's going on um, with you, with your care, you know, that kind of thing. Autonomy, a familiar principle to those of us in ethics, right? So deliberative self-rule being the sort of Kantian conception of, of autonomy. Um, here, um, the need to control the course of their lives. So that difference between choice versus um, compliance. Um, and then relatedness the need to have a close, affectionate relationship with others. We don't need to have an affectionate relationship with our clinicians, um, but you can encourage a sense of relationship um, that's appropriate with your patients, and you can do that um, in conversation with them. So the overall aim of this theory is to motivate behaviors um, conducive to good health outcomes um, using broad-based ethical norms of elevating the good and minimizing harm. So this theory's been um, examined. This is an old theory, actually. The work on this began in the 70s, and then um, uh, these two authors put it together uh, and published like their sort of primary work in 1985-ish. And it's been used a lot in um, settings like uh, exercise to motivate, like I used the coach analogy. It fits really well with that. Um, weight loss. Uh, homework completion for my parents in the room. Um, and so it's also been used quite a bit in in-clinic communication so that in, you can use this when you talk to people. Um, and so using that to talk to people, to patients about their care has, has um, been shown to work. It has not been used or, or proven or studied really very um, much in these out-of-clinic asynchronous settings I mean, that's the work that Katie and I are doing with um, some of the clinics that we've been working with. So, um, so I'm gonna provide an example, a little bit of a case study, and I'm drawing entirely, well, not entirely hypothetically here. Um, I'm pulling primarily from um, the existing literature to create this. I didn't wanna draw on the clinics that we're currently working with because we haven't completed the research um, on, on the materials that we've created. So, so here's your case study. Um, and just a little fun joke there for my genetics inclined folks. Um, so here's your case study. So you have a participant, Sarah, who's uh, in your clinic and she's participating in a clinical research study. As part of this study, incidentally or intentionally, it kind of doesn't matter, um, she's been identified as a carrier for cystic fibrosis. Preemptively, She's identified her sister, Julie, as someone she would be comfortable receiving this genetic information. And so if Sarah is a carrier, Julie may be too. And so the information has relevance to Julie. And so how do you notify her or do you? Uh, I like this case um, because it is fraught. It has all of the problems, right? Um, it, it, if you contact Julie, she's not your patient. She's not in the trial. You have no relationship or interaction with her whatsoever before this. So if we refer back to our sort of the canonical babbling scenario, you're gonna create that for her um, initially in an out of clinic context when you notify her that she might be a carrier for cystic fibrosis. The information that you're going to be giving her, this you might be, um, is a risk of, not the 
thing itself. And the thing itself is also a risk because if she's a carrier, she's not going to necessarily have cystic fibrosis or, or um, but she has a, if she decides to have children, it has relevance. So it creates these sort of multi-layered, how do you put this in a letter? What are you gonna say to this person about what their risks are? Ideally, what you want to do when you notify Julie is you want her to call you, right? You want her to get in touch with you to schedule further testing to find out if she actually is a carrier and then have a conversation about what that means um, for follow-up. So how do we do that? So this is a letter that's drawn from um, a published article um, by Susan Wolf, I think is her first name. And this article is actually fantastic. Pragmatic tools for sharing genomic research results with the relatives of living and deceased research participants. In many respects, this paper is phenomenal. It provides a complete framework that I think is probably pretty good for getting preemptive consent um, in research trials and in genetic testing um, for notifying implicated family members. So you might have a HIPAA issue otherwise um, with conveying genetic results to somebody who is not your patient. So this article suggests that if you engage in a preemptive consent process with the patient, you can avoid all kinds of problems that can come up during the course of genetic testing, like losing your patient, a follow-up, having your patient die before the results come back. Sometimes these tests can take a long time for the results to come back. Um, and so, uh, so you avoid that with the with a consent. And I think their their plan for approaching that on the front end with the patient is great. Um, I think this letter is not. So this is their proposed letter to then send to Julie, um, your the hypothetical Julie, um, just sort of sua sponte, right? So. Sarah has said she's somebody who's relevant um, or can receive the information. There's no HIPAA violation. Um, and so here's your form letter to send. Dear relatives, all right, dear Julie, your relative Sarah has participated in a genetic research study. In that study, we discovered that your relative has a genetic result called, you know, she's a carrier of cystic fibrosis. Insert description of pathogenic result and associated risk. So we're not out of the first paragraph yet, and we're already talking about you know, the, the possible risks of this um, disease or, or carrier status. Um, I think, you know, the risks, I think we underestimate the way our patients interact with risk. And there's been some pretty good research on this. I think actually Peter Schwartz has done a significant amount of it. Um, but patients approach risk in a very different way than we as clinicians do. And they, they um, overestimate um, uh, uh, risk and and then sort of underestimate their likelihood to fall into a risk category. So it, it's very sort of strange. Um, and, um, and so the ability to sort of do anything with this is gonna be kind of problematic. Um, it's kind of funny, just as a little aside, my um, daughter is 10 and she likes to watch Game of Games with Ellen. And so we were watching it the other night and one of the um, pharmaceutical ads came on and she, I think she wasn't paying a whole lot of attention to it, but she sure did start to listen when they rattled off all the risks. She's 10. And, you know, it was, you know, risk of bleeding, risk of, you know, all of this stuff. And she's like, who would take that drug? Um, so, you know, I already know a little bit about the way she weighs these things. She is a professional patient. My daughter is uh, a Riley, a Riley kid. Um, but yeah, I mean, she's, but I think a lot of people, um, would maybe be turned off by the, the presence of risk. So it is possible that you may have inherited this same genetic result, but it is also possible that you did not inherit this variant. Um, variant being a word that maybe patients might not know. Um, you may want to seek genetic counseling and consider genetic testing to find out. To arrange a meeting with a genetic counselor, please contact. If you have further questions, please contact signed researcher. So, um, so from an ethical perspective, actually, well, from a communication perspective, um, this letter is kind of problematic. Um, we're assuming that Julie will be motivated by her concern over her unknown carrier status, and that will motivate her to call, right? That will motivate her to, to follow up. But worry and fear can actually motivate people to withdraw. Um, and so the letter might go into the pile of things that Julie doesn't want to think about, right? Literally or figuratively. And so she doesn't do what you want her to do. 
From an ethical perspective, this letter is equally problematic because it doesn't respect what we would call the patient's right not to know. So it's designed to place some pretty consequential complex information um, into the letter without considering the fact that when you send a person a letter, you enter their private space with your voice and no ability for them to respond to that. So any of us here who have sat down on the couch with a cup of coffee on a Saturday morning and flipped open the computer, right, and entered your email to find some not friendly message, you know, in response, understand, like you've been there, right? Like, what is this? And what, what's happening here? And I don't understand what the tone of this is so, that kind of thing. My mom has eight sisters, so I know a lot about this. Um, but, but we've all kind of been there. And so when you do that as a clinician, you, you, you enter that space um, that Saturday morning with the coffee and you drop a bomb, right? And so that's what would be happening here for Julie. So, um, so I've taken the, for the purposes of this lecture, I've taken this letter and rewritten it um, using self-determination theory. It's longer. I'm okay with that. Um, we are writing because, the name of the participant, underwent genetic testing with our clinic and listed you as someone she wanted to receive the results. Genetic testing sometimes shows that a genetic condition runs in the family. If one person has it, their family members are more likely to have it. So-and-so had this kind of testing that can let us know whether or not there is a genetic condition that runs in your family. Because of this, family members of our patients may want to know the results of testing that our patients have had, and we ask our patients ahead of time for that contact information. Sometimes testing results show that a person does not have a condition that can be passed down, and family members like to know that a genetic problem has been ruled out. Still other times, people would not People would rather not know the results of testing at all, and that's also perfectly fine. The fact that you are receiving this letter does not mean that you have a genetic disease or condition. It just means that Sarah had testing done, the results have come back, and you have been identified as someone who is authorized to receive the results if you would like them. This letter is not time sensitive. There's no deadline for you to contact us. Please feel free to contact us when it's convenient for you, and we can discuss these results together. So some of the things that are missing, well, actually, let me, I've coded it um, with, our, with the self-determination theory um, model. I think a lot of these statements actually could fit into more than one category, and that's great. They do more than one thing at a time. But green is competence, right? This is the why are you here, why are you getting this letter, what happened? Um, the purple is autonomy. Here are the choices you can make, and you can see that some of, the, some of the choice language has been couched also in a relatedness language, which is great. Um, and then the pink is the relatedness, that, that idea of um, we're in this together, uh, it's okay what you decide, I'm, you know, I'm sort of here for you, um, and, and comfort language. The fact that you're receiving this letter doesn't mean you're sick, right? People want to know that. Um, please feel free to contact us when it works for you. Um, just sort of some sort of like friendly, softening language. Um, but some of the things that are missing from this letter include the name of the disease, because people will just Google that and scare themselves, and because that will encourage people to call to get the name of the disease or the name of the condition, um, and the risks and, and, you know, pathophysiology of the disease, the, you know, the, the suggestion that that information be included, what was it? Um, the pathogenic results and associated risk are also missing. But one of the important things that this letter does, at least from an ethical perspective, is that it allows the patient, the, well, not the patient, the family member that you're contacting to simply opt out of knowing this, right? If they are somebody who does not want to receive this result, they don't want to know whether or not they're a carrier for something, um, they don't have to. Uh, they don't have to contact you at all. More importantly, perhaps, for our clinicians in the room, Phrasing the language in this way, appealing to those three basic human components of competence, relatedness, and autonomy will actually encourage the patient to call, which is what you want anyway, because you want them to be tested to see whether they are a carrier, whether they could pass that on to their children. So if you go to the original letter, again, what you see is really the only purpose was to inform and get a phone call. 
So it's, it's all green, right? It's all competence. Here's some information, call me. Um, and I would suggest that sometimes, you know, we, we might have to do that. Um, but if you actually want a phone call, uh, you might, it would be better to make the, the letter theory informed. All of medicine, or hopefully much of medicine, is empirically informed. And so our asynchronous communication should probably be as well. So my conclusions then. Our correspondence with patients is critically important to both understanding and adherence to treatment plans. Utilizing a theory-informed approach can increase the effectiveness, effectiveness of this communication. And self-determination theory specifically addresses the psychological needs of the patient and is ethically sound. And so with that, I conclude and open it up for questions. Oh. So we saw that Meg Gaffney walked in the room, and uh, I just wanted to say a couple of words about Margaret Meg Gaffney, after whom this lecture was named a couple of years ago. So Meg Gaffney, some of you probably know her if you've been around IU for a while. She is now an emerita uh, professor of clinical medicine at the School of Medicine and was here for 30 years, Meg. Uh, she has an undergraduate degree from Indiana University in English, and then uh, became interested in ethics when she studied with the uh, with William May, who was one of the fathers of American ethics, and then spent many years here at the School of Medicine uh, teaching ethics and humanities and inspiring humanism in countless uh, younger and older people, including myself and others. So, Meg, we're so glad that you were able to join us today and just want to welcome you, if you wouldn't mind standing, so that we can give you a round of applause. Great, a great inspiration to all of us. Thanks. If a patient is likely to lose 40 to 80 percent of what they learn and you communicate with a family member of theirs, are they most likely to turn to the person who they have a sort of affinity to oh. for communication and what is that kind of a letter because you've looped in all of them and because they don't know what the disease is, I would immediately call my friend, my sister, rather than the provider who may have sent that communication yeah. and what does that do to what you're trying to communicate? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I haven't, we haven't studied the, the loop. Um, but that's an interesting idea that you, you get the letter and you, you know, even though the clinician hasn't been able to contact Sarah, the sister may be able to, um, and so does. And what did, what, do you, what did you get back? You know, um, cyst, you know, I'm a carrier for cystic fibrosis. Um, I mean, I, I still think that the, I mean, I think that the key to the self-determination theory is actually that relatedness component. Um, that the, that that's the, the, one of the kind of important things. And so I still think that probably um, to get more information, the sister is going to contact the, the person who sent the letter um, with the information because you've established or you're, you begin to establish that relationship um, in the letter. Um, and maybe they also get information from their sister as well. Yeah. I don't know. Have you seen that loop in your practice? No, I'm not a physician, but I was just curious oh. because Right. Yeah. I mean, so that's one of the phenomenons that's that's really um, that's also kind of concerning is the the sort of relay of um, information. So, um, you know, if you want somebody to communicate with their family member about their increased risk of disease and how how much of that can they communicate, they actually be able to communicate more if you send them a letter, the patient a letter, because everything that they lost. Well, not everything, but some of the stuff they lost during the appointment, they would regain through the letter. Um, so you're, it's, you're never going to be probably 100%, but maybe you can improve. Yeah. Jane, thanks for sharing all this great information. Uh, this is always food for thought. As a, uh, as a um, old-time practicing physician, um, I have, you know, seen the wave of, uh, of electronic information 
kind of come our way. And uh, it's got so many uh, things that can be useful, but it seems like sometimes talking about risks and benefits, I sometimes think the risks outweigh the benefits for many of those things. A face-to-face -face conversation is always in, in so many ways so good, but um, one of the thoughts I had, and I wasn't sure where this lecture was going to be leading, but it, was, uh, but it made me think about the whole business of the patient portals that are now being promoted and encouraged, and we're supposed to sign up people for this. What kind of ramifications could you potentially kind of equate with this you know, in the sense of how information is relayed from physician's office to patient through the portal, which is obviously a one-way street as well. Yeah, I, so I think some of the communication that happens through the portal can be informed by self-determination theory, a little bit of it. Um, but, I mean, I, I'm, there's not much you can do with that. And I, as I, you reference being an old-time physician, I always joke around, or I, I have joked around about the fact that when I first started practicing medicine, the charts were, or practicing law, the charts were paper. And um, as an attorney, the thing that really helped me was all of those beautifully handwritten nursing notes, <laughs> right? That had the timelines and the times written and the details and, you know, so-and-so had jello at whatever time. And there's no, and that's missing from medicine. So I share your sort of loss of that as a source of information. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the portal communication because I think we give people a lot of information that they don't understand and don't know what to do with, but they want it. Um, and, and so I think it's probably here to stay. I don't use it as a patient ever. I have no idea. Um, so, so you, I think there are limitations on it. The longer the communication, the more, the more in depth you're trying, to, what you're trying to communicate is the more I think you should rely on this theory. But if it's like your CBC came back and these are the values, there's not much you can do there. Yeah, I'm really glad that the last letter you put up, or second last, was wrong. I'm sitting there thinking it's got to be wrong. <laughs> but when you show the last one, what is your obligation to make sure receipt of the, inf the letter and information? Yeah, so I'm going to apply uh, mailbox rules there, which is an old uh, lawyer idea, which is that um, if you put it in the mail, it counts as having been sent. Um, so it's not your obligation to make sure somebody receives it. Uh, it's not even your obligation to make sure that it's received in the you know way it's necessarily intended. I mean, the idea behind this is an attempt to improve on a form of communication that we haven't maybe given very much thought to. I think uh, secondarily trying to make sure that people get it is, you know, that people receive the letter and, and um, we can't necessarily be responsible for that. Is that any more than we could be with the letters that we send now. Other questions? Brian? Um, I thought that was very interesting and invigorating. I had a question for you. If you go back to your example of the letter, um, when we think about informed consent process, one of the things that we discuss is, you know, um, communicating a recommendation and then uh, identifying uh, viable alternatives to it, including do nothing, right, when appropriate. And I guess the one thing that stands out to me about the initial letter and this one is it is um, exceptionally non-directive. And do we have any obligation to make a recommendation about what we encourage the res whoever receives this letter to do, um, rather than it just being a, something was done, if you want that information, yeah. you have access to it. So, um, so this is a, one of the things is that's obviously going to be important is tailoring the letter to the setting. This letter is tailored to uh, this particular case study that is pulled from this article. And so this is a little bit softer maybe um, because the person's not your patient, the person's distantly sort of involved, um, you know, and so there's, it's a little bit more like you can or you can't. With other um, sorts of examples of this where you're, for example, doing um, like uh, genetic testing on a child to identify a seizure disorder or something like that. And, um, and what you want then is for the mother to follow up or the father to follow the parents to follow up with specific, you know, here are your recommendations, one, two, three. One of the things that is um, important um, in this process of letter writing that um, from Katie's in my perspective anyway is 
is even making those recommendations much, much clearer so that people actually follow them. So a lot of times those recommendations will be at the bottom of the letter after five pages of reading. I would suggest that they go at the top of the letter. Here's what you should do. Um, and below explains why. And then um, in addition to that, our recommendations oftentimes include recommendations that actually aren't for the patient or for the parent. So, um, or they, they don't require initiation. It's unclear who's supposed to initiate that next step. So um, we would recommend that you um, obtain a mammogram yearly. Okay, well, are you gonna call me for that or am I supposed to call you for that? So, so the following recommendation would be, here's the phone number you call. Right, this is a you recommendation. You should, we frame it in, in the, the language in that way. Um, so, so some of our, the, the stuff that we've been crafting has been responsive, I think, to exactly that concern, much more directive. Hi, um, I have actually been studying this theory and using it in some of my own studies. And the relatedness piece is really, really important. And in looking at this and the other things that you're talking about, um, I think you have to finish strongly with the relatedness piece. So if you send a letter saying, you make the phone call, you finish with, and we will help you set up an appointment. Oh, thanks, yeah. Or, you know, if you're trying to get them to take the test, you say, once you get the results, we will help you figure out what to do from there. Yeah, we can discuss these together. Yeah, yeah, like, so that there's that relatedness piece that comes after whatever it is that you're asking them to do. I really, really agree with you that the relatedness component is the key to the motivation, too. And it's ironic that that's the piece that is almost absent frequently from the communication. So oftentimes that relatedness component, a component occurs only in the signature line with a sort of like best wishes or very truly yours, which is not really, you know, relatedness. So, or you get the sort of thank you for coming to our clinic, which is also only sort of lip service to that need that people have. Anybody else? All right, thank you, Jane. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you.